thank you very much for your very kind words of introduction. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much to the uh, <coughs> Institute for uh, International European Affairs for the fantastic opportunity uh, to, uh, to uh, spend, to celebrate uh, the 50th anniversary of the Elysee Treaty here in Dublin. Um, I can think of no better place to do it, and you're all testimony to the fact that Ireland is the place to be um, on, uh, on, on days like this. Now, as you, as you said, I'm, I'm in a sense the embodiment of uh, the fact that <clears throat> the Elysee Treaty uh, worked, although my parents miscalculated, and uh, I was born two years, two years too early, so I was around when the treaty was signed. <clears throat> but um, um, my father, who was, um, was then a young, <clears throat> a young uh, uh, international official in Paris, was asked out for the, a night at the opera uh, with Adonai and de Gaulle, because uh, uh, there was a, a night at the opera after the signing, and he had no dinner jacket, <clears throat> or rather he had his father's dinner jacket, which uh, was made in Berlin in 1929, um, and which had survived the various uh, his accidents of history to be, to be outed, I think, for the last time uh, at uh, the opera in Paris um, in, uh, after the Elysee Treaty. Um, the, the treaty, you've really said all there is to say, and I've, uh, there's very little to add, so um, I, will be, I will be brief, um, and I'll be boring, and I'll shock you with it probably by saying, Continuity and change in Franco-German relations is all continuity, very little change. Um, as you rightly said, the treaty, which was not really a beginning, but rather the culminating point of a process of Franco-German uh, reconciliation, or rather re a reinvention of the Franco-German relationship <coughs> after, of course, uh, uh, the, the disaster that was the first half of the 20th century. Um, and you could, I think, almost go further back in history and say the periods of disasters very much started with the Thirty Years' War. Um, so the treaty was the culminating point of an attempt, a successful attempt, uh, by the Fr French and the German leadership to reinvent uh, the Franco-German relationship and turn it from an engine of war and conflict and instability into a motor of European peace. Uh, Conrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle, the German Chancellor at the time, and uh, <clears throat> the French President, uh, were of course are the two names we remember and rightly associate with the Elysee Treaty. Uh, but I would just like to mention the name of a French politician who preceded de Gaulle in a sense, Robert Schumann, um, uh, the, uh, the French Foreign Minister at the, at the time, um, who with Jean Monnet and others um, uh, worked very successfully with Adenauer on, uh, well not only on creating um, uh, European integration post-war, but also on making that happen through the Franco-German relationship. And in that sense, I would say that the Elysee Treaty is the culmination of a first chapter in Franco-German relations. Um, and at the same time, of course, the basis of everything that followed. Um, now, I'm, may, I do, may I do, since we have uh, Lycéen or Gymnasiasten amongst us, may, may I do a, a sort of rather, who has read the Elysee Treaty? <laughs> Who actually read it? <coughs> well, I think that's very impressive. You know, percentage-wise, that's a far bigger percentage of the of of what you'd get if you asked not only the French and German population at large, but you know, even people who who should make it their business to read treaties like that. In fact, I must confess that I only read it myself uh, uh, a little while ago in the run-up to the uh, to the uh, Elysee 50 years anniversary because I got a lot of rather a lot of calls from journalists and asked me to comment on it and I thought. Well, maybe I should read it, actually. And it's full of surprises. It's very short. Um, one surprising thing is that uh, it's a very good treaty because it's short and it's clear and it's precise. Uh, a second surprise is that one of the main focuses of the treaty is on foreign affairs and defense. That's where you know, the dynamic of Franco-German um, cooperation and uh, rapprochement of positions should lie. Well, when you see what's happened over Mali uh, and before that over Libya, um, you can say, you know, there's still an awful lot to do. So um, the big parts of the treaty, despite of the existence of the Franco-German military brigade and despite the existence of VADS and other things, um, important, an important th political thrust of this treaty is, is, hasn't really led to a very, a very strong dynamic. Uh, what it has done, um, well, I don't know if I can say this in a country such as Ireland, but it's a bit like... Um, it's, it's for the Franco-German relationship, the Elysee Treaty is a bit like the Bible for, you know, for Christians or the church. It's, not everyone has read all of it, 
some people have, haven't read it at all, but it's, it's very important that it's there because it creates a foundation and a mental framework. And it has committed successive governments to, um, to, to maintain a dynamic in Europe uh, which has successfully operated as that engine for European peace for which it was devised. Um, now, I think it's important to understand three things. One is very obvious to anyone who reads the news. Uh, this has never been uh, an easy relationship and will never be an easy relationship. In fact, it is successful as an engine of European integration because it is not an easy relationship. France and Germany are very different countries with very different um, cultural reference points, very different political traditions, very different instincts when it comes to an awful lot of policy areas. So what you usually get is that they start from really diverging points of view. Uh, look at the debate over, look at the way they've dealt with the, Europe, the Eurozone crisis, you know, how much austerity is good for Europe. Uh, the banking union is another example of, a very recent example of uh, France and Germany coming from very different positions and in the process of negotiating it, um, an awful lot of innuendo, hostility, skepticism, they're not playing a straight car, they're defending their narrow national interest, but at the end, you get a compromise between the two. And because that compromise is the amalgamation of two very different sensitivities, a priori, because it's forged through hard, hard, press of hard, tough negotiation, it is often a compromise that is then acceptable to everyone else, more or less, because it already integrates so many different points of view. Um, the second point I would make is that the reason why the Franco-German relationship has survived uh, for so long, and I think will continue to do very well for the foreseeable future, uh, is because it is a necessary one in Europe. It's not, it hasn't survived because it's bilaterally so, so vital for both countries to engage in so many bilateral meetings and, uh, and, uh, and, and regular consultations, even if they're very worthwhile things like uh, youth exchanges and so on, which were launched by the treaty and which, which work well. It's vital because of its European function. It's vital because of its, um, uh, because of its role as a compromise building machine. And because of the influence that France and Germany can exert jointly if they come to a compromise, and which is far bigger, immeasurably, big, immeasurably bigger than any influence any of these two could hope to ex exert on their own. The enticement for Berlin and Paris to continue to ex exercise very strong influence in Europe and to, to a large extent shape uh, or help shape um, the way the European Union is evolving um, is an invitation to both governments to continue, to continue the difficult process of achieving compromise despite um, in instinctively often adverse reactions to, um, to, uh, to any, any new situation um, or any new problem. Uh, the third point I would like to make is that it's often overlooked uh, that the Franco-German relationship, which, again, for which the Elysee Treaty, if you like, gives the, gives the, the, uh, un, 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 uh, the written but often unread framework, um, is that it's a relationship that operates in only selected policy areas. It's, despite what the treaty wanted to achieve, it is not a relation that really exists in the field of foreign relations. There is no Franco-German couple. There is no Franco-German, well, access is a problematic word, but you know, structural and, and foundational relationship in the field of foreign policy. There may be accidents of history, accidental moments when, where both countries agree um, on, an, on an important point of international debate, like, um, uh, like when Gerhard Schröder and Jacques Chirac jointly opposed the Iraq war. Uh, but those are accidental moments. Uh, we've seen over Libya, uh, over the Franco-British decision to, uh, to uh, depose, de facto, uh, Gaddafi, um, uh, that, um, uh, that there is no Franco-German uh, effort at all there. And we're seeing the same thing, I would argue, over Mali. And there was no particular, particularly close, despite what had happened in Libya. Um, again, you know, Berlin stayed, stayed, uh, uh, stayed, uh, stayed, stayed out of it to a large, large extent, even if they're now, they're now sending two transport planes. Where the Franco-German relationship is crucial is, I would, I would, uh, I would suggest, is in two areas of, of European policy. One is everything that's to do with money, uh, the economy, and we've seen that, of course, in the Eurozone crisis. Uh, and the other is uh, with everything that's to do with the future um, 
I'm going to use the word despite the failure of the treaty, constitutional shape or the uh, present and future constitutional shape of Europe, the way European integration uh, evolves. And of course, these are precisely the two areas, the, uh, the la chose économique, the uh, money and the economy, um, and on the one hand, and the, uh, the constitutional evolution of Europe, the evolution of Europe's political architecture, uh, which have been at the heart of the Eurozone crisis in the last few years, and where we've seen um, that the Franco-German couple remains absolutely crucial. Because what happened, of course, um, 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 or an, an analysis that was very prevalent when we saw the last uh, big EU enlargement was that the multiplication of member states and the fact that mechanically the combined, the combined weight, weight of France and Germany would diminish, um, uh, then so a lot of people thought and wrote at the time meant that the Franco-German couple would stop being so central uh, to EU politics and would stop being so crucially relevant. Well, I think the Euro Eurozone crisis has demonstrated with extraordinary force uh, that that analysis just wasn't true. Um, and I think it's going to remain untrue until the day where European integration has led to, if it ever comes, has led to something that is more or less like the United States of Europe. Unless, until the day when the member states and their populations uh, have agreed to transfer so much authority, so much power to Europe's common institutions that the alliances between member states just don't matter particularly, just as whether Texas and California and the US agree or not is, you know, is, is, is interesting but not crucial to the shape of American politics. Until that day comes, if it ever comes, uh, I think that the Franco-German um, entity, political entity such as it is, will remain absolutely central. And because it remains central, it will remain alive um, because it's in both capital's national interests not to dilapidate that extraordinary power tool uh, that is a Franco-German compromise. So that's continuity. And now very briefly, uh, much more briefly, change. Um, well, a lot of people say because of Germany's current economic success and France's current economic travails, there is a new uh, extremely destabilizing um, disequilibrium between France and Germany, which is bad for the relationship, weakens it, and, and, uh, and puts its future into a degree of doubt. I, I don't quite buy that. I remember 10 years ago Germany being the sick man of Europe. Um, I don't think it is at all preordained that you know, France won't regain competitiveness. Look at demography, works for France, works very much against Germany. But even if Germany continued to be economically much more successful than France, and France continued to have um, problems, I, I still think that the, the, the reality that these two countries together can achieve much, much more uh, can have much stronger influence than each country separately, even Germany separately remains as true as ever. Um, another point of change, so that is change I would to some extent dismiss as uh, almost irrelevant. That's a gross exaggeration, but I would, I would uh, you know, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll leave it there. The other, uh, the other change that is not dismissible um, is what, what's happened since the election of Francois Hollande. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you know, the relationship is in terrible state because they're quarreling all the time. They've always quarreled all the time. They quarreled all the time during the Mercosy area. What has changed is that Mercosy, for per per perfect, uh, sorry, Sarkozy, <laughs> for perfectly uh, uh, noble and legitimate and understandable reasons, has chosen to not highlight the differences usually. Why? Because there was a fear, I think a perfectly justified fear, that if um, France and Germany, <coughs> uh, Sarkozy and Merkel at the time, uh, highlighted their differences, the financial markets might say, ooh, um, you know, uh, they, these two disagree. Well, uh, that, that adds instability to an already highly unstable situation uh, at the height of the uh, Eurozone crisis, the peak of it. Uh, and also there was a fear in Paris that then uh, the, the, the markets might start treating France like a periphery country. Uh, and so in order for that not to happen, uh, the strategy was to cleave as closely to Berlin as you possibly could in your public presentation of what was going on. But um, sub Rosa, there was a lot of disagreement. Now, Hollande has done the exact opposite. He in his electoral campaign, he campaigned for a policy change in Berlin. And he said, you know, I'm not Angela Merkel. I'm not Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, I'm Francois Hollande. 
And in a sense, he's continued to do that since after his election. She, elle, c'est elle, moi, c'est moi. Um, he, could, he could get away with it because the markets, until now, and despite the economists uh, cover, or some economists cover with sort of bombs and other things, uh, have decided to treat France as a safe haven. Um, and and had, with a lot of credit to the Hollande government. Uh, and the French refinancing costs are practically as good as, uh, as, good as Germany's. Uh, and that has given along the, uh, the political leeway to, um, to highlight the differences with Angela Merkel, which serves him, of course, in his own domestic politics. Um, in, in fact, what, if you look at what's really happening, you're still in the classical scenario of franco German relations. Um, uh, the banking union is a classical example of joint project, disagreements, and then compromise, which then becomes more or less the European compromise. On other issues like um, how to treat Athens, what conditions to exact from Athens in, in exchange for European help, where a lot of people thought there'd be a big clash if Hollande gets elected between Berlin and Paris. There hasn't been any clash at all. Uh, it goes completely unreported because there's no story. Uh, Paris and Berlin agree on, since the election of Hollande on how to, how to deal with Athens. In fact, they agree more than um, um, Sarkozy and Merkel did. And you've got other very important things like um, the, the, the tacit franco german compromise, which, um, or endorsement of uh, the, the famous announcement by um, Draghi last summer that he would, uh, uh, that he, would uh, that the, he had created the OMT program, uh, and, and that which of course was a huge, uh, huge element in, in diffusing the crisis. Again, the result of an, uh, a tacit, franco but very powerful Franco-German agreement and compromise. So de facto, uh, the relationship functions pretty much as it always has. What's changed is that Hollande, for domestic policy reasons, has chosen to put the, uh, the spotlight on divergence rather than convergence. While still saying, of course, I work on compromises and I build them, and this remains vital. That, in a sense, is a presentational change. But of course, if it's sustained for too long, it builds up levels of irritation in Berlin which could become damaging. And my wish for the future uh, would be that after the German elections, not before, because we're going to see differences continuing to be highlighted in the, in the run-up to the election for domestic policy reasons, po possibly by both partners, will enter a phase when if Merkel remains in office, as most people in Germany think they, she will, uh, Hollande will um, yeah, just change the direction of the project slightly. Uh, in, substance, in substance, as I said, the, the, the thing continues to work. I expect it to continue working uh, for the foreseeable <coughs> decades. And um, it'll be up to the partners uh, of France and Germany to continue to do what I think they've done successfully, which is be very worried um, if the Germans and French don't agree sufficiently and then encourage them to do so. But once you get a German and French agreement, remind both partners that they're not alone in Europe and that there are other voices that must be heard. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to our discussion. <laughs>